other famous character that was the boyfriend of Rush in, in, in Vic and Sade. This is Smelly Clark, who is my buddy. And uh, speaking of that, listen, I'll tell you. I, I know, I'll tell you, I know, I, I know why the angry people of the world are the people who get up early in the morning. I'm sorry. I cannot, I cannot imagine a dynamic dictator getting up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and putting his socks on and combing his hair and saying, Ah, oh, well, I think I'll wait until after supper before I shave. Uh, no, 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 because there's something in the air. I'm telling you, I am coming along 6th Avenue. It's fantastic morning. You know, the sun is beating down. Oh, boy, you know, it's the kind... What ha Have you noticed that, that all women look at least 150% sexier in the morning when you're coming to work? It's just a just thing. I don't know what it is. I think it's the way the sun hits them. Or, or maybe it's the way the sun hits the top of my head. I don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, before we get into other uh, and more controversial topics, how about a little whoopee note here? Oh, well, let me put it another way. The Republican, the, 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 the Republican, I think the party, because uh, if we don't wipe, then we've uh, got to pay the piper. Well, sir, isn't it true uh, that it'll be a better party if the hostess employs a little accent? Well, let me make this perfectly clear. I think people should be employed regardless of uh, their accent. No, I mean, uh, she uses accent on the food. Oh, yes. Well, I, uh, I wouldn't care to uh, comment one way or the other. You have heard of accent, though, in the red cylindrical container. Well, I, I wouldn't care to uh, say that I had. And then, on the other hand, I wouldn't... I know uh, accent is uh, a season of some sort. Oh, or... not actually, sir. It has no flavor of its own. Uh... Oh, yes. I recall. Accent brings out the flavor nature's already put uh, in the beef or spring beans, whatever. I think it's important uh, to bring these facts out in the open is one of the basics of democracy. Part of the real grassroots? Well, I suppose it will bring the flavor out in grassroots. I uh, really uh, wouldn't care to uh, be quoted on that. Could you give us a definite statement on accents? Well, perhaps, uh, possibly. Uh, uh, no. But you are going to pick up some accents. Uh, we'll see. What was all that about? I mean, uh, sometimes you have a feeling that you're caught in some kind of gigantic, surrealistic washing machine, some kind of a Maytag that's got you by the foot. <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of, of, uh, of this surrealistic world, I, I'm looking at the sun, you know, coming, oh, it's just a fantastic day, you know, and, and, and my stomach is flat and, and my blood is flowing like mad through my veins and my eyes are shining this morning. It's a great morning, you know, and, and in my soul is playing my kazoo. You know, something like... And I'm walking along, and it's on 6th Avenue, you see. And then I see this great, just this enormous tidal wave of human beings flowing up and down 6th Avenue, back and forth, all going to whatever nefarious place they're going. You wonder what they're all about to do, you know. And, and, uh, and it suddenly hit me. I, a terrible thought hit me, Tony. Maybe this is why I will never be an official morning time guy, you know. Morning time people have a certain, uh, a certain ebullient, constant optimism. They give you the time at 8.16 as if it is a new concept. Every morning, and it's 8.16. I said, well, for crying out loud, we finally reached it, and wait till we get to 818. That's a great moment. And let me tell you, when do we hit 832? <laughs> and now we go on with the Norman Luboff Choir. Well, you have to, uh, you have to have a certain outlook, you see. Well, anyway, I'm walking along. I don't know what, yeah, well, I guess it is a certain outlook. So I'm walking along the street there, and I see all these people coming at me. And it, it immediately hits me. This is a city of over 11 million people, you know, including, uh, Teaneck. And uh, it's, uh, I guess we have to include Teaneck. I mean, they mean well. Come on now, Tony. It's not their fault. And, and uh, so we're, we're walking along, and I see these people come, and it suddenly hits me. How many of these guys, it's Thursday morning, are heading for the office to be fired today? Only they don't know it. <laughs> there has to be, out of 11 million people, there has to be a certain percentage of guys over whose neck the axe is not only hovering, but is rapidly descending. And so I'm walking along there, seeing the old kazoo is going, <laughs> Oh, boy. And off to my left, I see a little shop. Now, here's, here's the kind of thing you see in the morning. You don't see this at 2 in the morning. I'm sorry. There's a little shop, you know, these little junk shops they've got all over around here in town where they're selling uh, used mittens and... All kinds of stuff like that, you know, Okinawan mugs with little handles, and when you when you drink out of them, they play Yes Sir, That's My Baby, and all that great stuff. You say, 
Well, <laughs> right out in, in front. <laughs> Listen to this scene. Right out in front on a little table, they had they had a, a big pile of stuff, and there were about, must have been at least 15 people standing around looking very excitedly out on the sidewalk at this pile of stuff. And I, and I sort of looked over to see what it was. I don't want to get caught in any big scene at this early in the morning. And I looked over, and there's a big sign that says, Pseudo Ivory Oyster Forks. Well, now, now uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how many people need an oyster fork to begin with, but a pseudo ivory oyster fork. And they did not say imitation. They said pseudo ivory oyster fork. And I thought, well, now, isn't that a description of it all? A pseudo ivory oyster fork rampant across a sea of dust mops. So get together, man. Press the button and we're off on another Today commercial. we have with us the man responsible for Heinz's new polystyle deals. Nothing more exciting in the morning than a singing pickle. Uh, I uh, I recall coming home. Oh, Peggy knows. Bye, George. Peggy, raise your hand once again. You get a gold star. Both you and Ed get gold stars now. She identified who Smelly Clark's best friend was outside of Rush. Uh, and and uh, you can see, you can really tell the real Americans, can't you? You really can. They don't chicken around with this little stuff. Yes, the, the, the name, I, I thought it was one of the great names in American fiction was Bluetooth Johnson. Bluetooth Johnson was Smelly Clark's best friend, and they were all, well, there was a triumvirate. Bluetooth Johnson, Smelly Clark, and Rush. And there was another guy, one other guy, and his uh, his first name started with an M. And who was their favorite movie star? And where did she appear continually in a movie called Hearts of Flame? Hearts of Flame. And what was the name of their favorite fictional character? They were constantly reading passages from the stirring books. Uh, I will I will I will give you a quote here. I will I will delete the name for those of you who want to test your infinite memory for American trivia. Blank blankety blank stood atop the ramparts. He turned slowly, his great massive jaw tightening in anger as he spoke. Lady Margaret, do not look at these rampaging aborigines. The sight could easily curdle your blood. He whirled and, withdrawing his saber from the scabbard, stood ready to defend the honor of the beauteous Lady Margaret. Honey, I'll meet you on the beach. I've got to stop for cigarettes. Okay. And this time, make it Salem. Let's try something different for a change. Try something different for a change. Light up for Salem. All the change, Salem, soft as fresh as your taste. By the soft taste of Salem, all the change. Next time you buy cigarettes, enjoy the refreshing taste of Salem filter cigarettes. Salem's softness freshens your taste. Ahead of Salem's modern filter, there's a rich tobacco blend, smooth with menthol, plus special paper that breathes in fresh air Pick with every breath. <laughs> Smoke Salem filter cigarettes. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get fired yet. Speaking of guys, you know, a, a suddenly awful thought hit me, Tony, on the way in when I just talked, those, told this little thing about all the guys coming in who are about to be fired, I noticed that the executive phone is ringing in the control room in there, the one with the red line on it. <laughs> the one that says switch to emergency program immediately. We will pick up transcribed organ moods now. Uh, <laughs> you know, speaking of uh, transcribed organ moods, uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know whether or not uh, most people have the the uh, same memories that I have. Of course, memory memory is a tricky thing. Uh, you, you you just can't you can't trust it for for well. I almost said what you can't trust it for, but I'd better not say it. But I can remember there was a guy in Chicago. Well, sir, it's late afternoon as we enter the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mrs. Victor Gook and her son, Mr. Rush Gook. 
Spade, who's established in her husband's easy chair beneath the floor lamp, nods over a novel she received as a Christmas present, while young Rush, lying at full length of the Davenport, gazes at the ceiling and thinks, thought. But suddenly sounds are heard in the kitchen. Listen. Hey, in here, Dive. Your mother help? She's asleep. I'm um, not either. Well, you look Is like... Is she you. upstairs? No. What's the big commotion? Oh, hello, kiddo. Hello. How are you going? Listen, there's a special lodge meeting call for this evening. We're saying 500 with Fred Ruth in this evening. Well, that'll have to be called off. L.W. Eakins from Chicago headquarters is in town. Look, you two guys will have to jump in and help a fella out. I've got to wear my regalia and memorize a special ritualistic greeting and everything else. Have to be down the hall by a quarter to five. It's almost four now. Andy, hop up from there and stand at attention and be ready to receive orders. You want me to go up? I want you to get me my lodge stuff from upstairs, make a telephone call to Hank Gutstop, and dig volume seven out of my lodge library, out of the bookcase, and 69 other things. Kiddo, you give me a hand, too, won't you? We got an engagement with Fred Ruthie. You know yourself. Well, that'll have to be canceled. I'm sorry, but it can't be up. Better phone him right now, then. Give him a chance to make other plans. All right. Goose cutter, let's not stand around with our teeth in our mouth. Try to land. Stay in bed till I get you calling, Ruthie. Well, I got no time to waste. Well, I'm not going to have you fellas clown around upstairs and tearing the house apart. There's stacks of Christmas presents in every single clothes closet, and I'm the only one that knows... Okay, it. but make it snappy. Rush, get me volume seven out of the bookcase. Okay. Two, five, seven, two, X, please. Correct. I have to learn an official greeting by heart. And I have to fold Hank Goodstuff and dictate an official greeting for him to memorize. Maybe you can do that. What's all this that's going on now? Well, what excuse shall I give him? You can't... Uh, L.W. Eakins is in town. Who's he? One of the major executives of the Chicago headquarters of the Sacred Stars... Hello, lady. I bet you were taking a nap. <laughs> I am seven now. Is that and so? Well, Rush and me have been doing the same thing. Vic went downtown right after dinner and just this minute got home. And he would have to memorize yeah. that paragraph, huh? Yeah. Oh, my, I bet you were. Uh, how long did he stay? Run up quick now and bring me down my lodge regalia. All of it. Well, I should think so. Boots, sword, tunic, broom, hat, your pants ain't available. Golly, yes. What do you mean? Well, I'm lending them to Tom Hackett. Happens every time. Who's Tom Hackett? Butcher over in Middleton Butcher Shop. He needed him to be Santa Claus. Dave. Well, what does Fred think? Dave. Hey, a person's trying to talk over... Excuse me, Ruthie. Vic's trying to say something in just a second. What's the matter? Are my large pants upstairs? Let's go they upstairs. If you put them upstairs. You lent them to Tom Hackett. Don't you remember Oh, him? golly, that's right. He took the part of Santa Claus and I... Well, yeah, this is the finest. You can drop by and pick them up. The landlady will give them to you. The landlady can go jump in the lake. I haven't We're got time to... through here, Vic. Ruthie's waiting on the wire. You may inform me. Please. Please. Lady, this is what I'm the sorry. Mm. Yeah. Oh, little frenzied brother of mine, wring sure. your cupping hands and listen for the call of the golden uh-huh. Mario. As maidens dance by the plashing oh, wheel... What? In the mischievous tarantella. Right, of... will you be quiet? Mm. Both of you be quiet. Hey, say, lady, I better tell you why I phoned. Yeah. We're not going to be able to play 500 this evening. No. Well, it's like this. Uh, Vic Lodge is having a special meeting. Yeah, some fellow from Chicago's in town, and I guess he's... Who's the fellow that... Will you sit through there and explain about my pants? I asked you a question. Who's the Chicago fellow? L.W. Eakins. Is the big, large muckety-muck? Yeah. Uh, he's some man named Mr. Eakins, some big muckety-muck in the lodge. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, look, this don't make any difference to you and Fred, does it? Uh-huh. Well, I thought I'd better get in touch with you right away so you could make other plans. Yeah. Will you make that step eh? Later on, the week will be grand. Surely. <laughs> you bet. Well, uh, you explain to Fred. Yes. All right, Lucy. All right. Goodbye. Thank you, Carl, for work yourself into a stool. You can pick up your lodge pants on the way downtown. I have to dress here. 
All right, let's rush Todd over after him. Todd over after him, Rush. Tom Hank, it lives on North Center Street, don't he? I haven't the remotest idea. Don't you know, meow. Shall I go there first, or shall I go to Smelly Clark's house first? Smelly Clark's house? Oh, yeah. Didn't you bring that back? Uh-uh. Oh, my. What's this mystery now? Well, don't jump to the ceiling, but rush, let Smelly Clark take your food. Give me permission, ma'am. Yeah, but I certainly thought you'd use your head enough to get rush, it back. Let Smelly Clark take my plumed hat to do what? He uses an ornament on his Christmas tree. See, they wanted something to put on the tip top of the tree to make they it... They round me up my plumed hat in my lodge rope without another second's delay. And I better go out. Say, I will make a little speech about what I think of people who lend out private possessions of others to every half-wit in well, town. Well, goodness, I never expected... I will make my speech later. Right now, however, I'm very closely pressed for time and would like to ask you to do me a favor. What is it? Telephone Hank Gutstaff and read him this paragraph. He's supposed to memorize it. I don't like Hank Gutstaff, Hank. It won't hurt you to call him on the telephone, will it? Well, I don't like him, and he knows I don't like him. And my own wife won't cooperate with me in the matter of the greatest importance. What you want me to tell him? I want you to read something to him. You have paper and pencil and write as you dictate. Hmm. Here's the place right here. Don't have to read a whole book to him, do I? Just this paragraph I'm pointing to. What's it supposed to be? Regular prescribed official greeting from an exalted little dipper to a visiting dignitary. I cast a memory. Hey! What's the better say? Well, this is that Greek jump. Latin jump. You expect me to make out a bunch of outlandish gibberish and simply pie. Read it just like you'd read English. Keep over the people's names, well, and before I it try... It sounds to... just like it looks. The word, first word is hick. H-I-C. Hick. Read it just like you'd read anything else. Here. Hick, dignity, apple oil, dumb, cluck, stimulant, hobo. Who is agricola, up to hunk. Sim, spittle, defeatus, in slab, dumb, corn, I won't do it. Baby, surely after lending my lodge pants to a perfect stranger to be Santa Claus in and giving my plumed hat to a hyena to put on his Christmas tree, you won't I'll read something in American, but I'll kiss a cow before I'll make a mini out of myself with that Greek joke. Okay, I'll memorize Hank's greeting. You can memorize my greeting. We'll switch speeches. Yours printed in American? Yeah. Let's see it once. Right here. Oh, little frenzied brother of mine, wring your clutching hands and listen to the call of the golden orient as maidens dance by the flashing pool and a mysterious tarantula. I'm not going to read that either. What? I'm not going to read that either. Brady, can it be possible? Yeah, you may call him that old Hank Gustaf on the telephone and call him pet names and tell him to wring his hands and. Dance with the girls uh-huh. and play in the splashing pool. Was that Rush? Huh? Rush? Yeah. He hasn't left the house yet. Well, I expect... What is the idea, sir? I brought you your boots. My boots? The lodge boots. Where was it? In the basement. I knew it was down there, so I hunted all over the furniture until I found it. Hang on. Where is my other boat? That's the big mystery. I looked at every dog on place. Where I is my other boat? I let Miss Husher have it. What for? Playing over the fireplace at Christmas time. It's always been a custom in her family to use boots instead of stockings for Santa Claus to put his presents now, in. Now, Patrick has my pants. Sally Clark has my plumed hat. And Miss Husher has my other boot. Is that correct? Well, goodness, you didn't give a person warning. You wanted everything all at once. I've had the slightest thing. Where's my sword? Slide up here in your bottom dresser drawer. It's all wrapped up nice and ready to use. Shall I go get it? How about my robe? Oh, your robe? My robe. Charlie Reese is some barn. And my tunic? Oh, what do you do with his tunic, Rush? You sent me over to Miss Brighton's with it. Oh, she wanted to use it. Tom Hackett has my pad. Mary Clark has my blue hat. Miss Husher has my boot, Charlie Rogerscum has my robe, and Miss Brighton has my tunic. I haven't much large regalia left. I haven't. Don't bother, 
Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. 